And the theme of Jeremiah is judgment. And the thing I want to say out of the gate is this simple thing. Judgment is not avoidable. Every single one of us is going to face the judgment. You see, sometimes people think, okay, I'm going to come and I'm, I'm going to give my life to Christ and there is going to be no judgment. But that's not true. I mean, it's not what the Bible says. The Bible is pretty clear. It says, it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. All of us at some point have to stand before God and answer for the life that we have lived. Jeremiah was a prophet. Now, I have to tell y'all, like, there are some things I'm glad I never had to do. And being a prophet is one of them. They were weird characters, right? Y'all can't read these prophets and not, they're not normal people, okay? One of them walked around naked for three years telling people to repent. I would have just ran and wouldn't have been going to his church. <laughs> um, you know, they, they just, they're, they're different kind of people, but to do what they did, they had to be somewhat eccentric. You know, they had to be a little bit different than everybody else because their only job was to say, repent and turn. That was their entire job, repent and turn. They were always, 100% of their sermons were, you're wrong, get right. There's not, you don't read these prophets and feel better. You know, you don't read the prophets and go, wow, how encouraging they are. You know, Jeremiah is the one we know the most about. He was, he, we see some of the most famous kings come along during Jeremiah's time. So he's a prophet for 40 years to the nation and he's preaching repentance the entire time. He's warning them that the coming Babylonian uh, conquest, the exile is, is getting ready to happen. He's like, you have sinned, you've turned from God and, and you need to repent and turn back to God. And Jeremiah's message is the same. Over and over and over and over and over again. Next week, we're going to get two, two Sundays actually about Jeremiah, not the book of Jeremiah, but the book of Lamentations uh, is a book from Jeremiah. And I'll talk a little bit more about that next week, but the, the two of them go together. We know more about Jeremiah than any of the other prophets. And what he's trying to tell them is judgment is coming and the only hope that you have is to repent and turn to the Lord. If you want to know the truth, that's still really the main message that we have to deliver anyway. Judgment is coming and the only thing that will help us to escape the consequences of judgment is to repent and turn to the Lord. And, and there, you know, there are a lot of conversations we could have about this. There, you know, there are people, I'm not the end times guy. You know, there are people who would tell you that we're living in the last days and, and, and the, the writers of the Bible believe they were living in the last days. So I have to believe I'm living in the last days as well. You know, uh, and that's, that's what I would tell you that that's kind of my take on it. And, and, and I'm not, I don't talk about those kind of things a, a whole lot. Here's, here's what I decided in my life. I believe that, that Jesus is coming back. There's going to be a judgment, and I need to be ready, and I don't really care when it happens. I just need to work until then. That's just kind of my approach to the whole thing. And so I don't sit down, and I, if people ask me about eschatological things and have you read this book and do you know, do you, you, know, do you think this event is, is, is what the Bible says? Maybe so, maybe not. Um, here's the thing I'm going to tell you. Just be ready. Repent and turn to the Lord. If it's appointed unto us once to die, and after that the judgment, the option for us is to make sure that we are right. And there are some things I want to talk to you about today because that I think are important. I want to share some things that I think are helpful. If you know that the judgment is coming, if you know at the end of life, if you know at, the, at my death, if you know when the Lord returns, whatever, if you believe that, there are some things you need to know to prepare for the judgment. So I want to talk to you. I'm going to give you four things today and two things next week. So that's six, so it's three and three. Because some of you think I have three points every Sunday. I don't. I got four today and two next week, but it's going to average out. Just make, <laughs> make you happy. 
Here's the first thing. Don't overlook the consequences. Every action, every action has a consequence. There is a cost to every choice that you make. Sometimes it works out in your favor, right? Sometimes the cost is less than the, the joy or the, the privilege or the thing that you're going to receive, all right? Sometimes that, that's the case. Like, um, I was trying to give, think of one that was clear. Um, It might be buying a, an automobile and you can't get to work, you know, and the choice is, okay, am I going to buy an automobile so I can keep my job or am I not? The cost is, you know, significant, but you, 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 the benefits outweigh the cost of it. Other times, the cost of the choice is more than the value that you receive from that choice. And we make those choices from time to time, okay? So, like, let's just say um, you, you decide to go to a party and you get drunk and you drive. There's a 100% chance you had a good time at that party, okay? You probably had a good time while you were drinking. But when you get pulled over, right, the cost is more than the joy you received. And so sometimes we make choices, and they're, they're always simple. Like, okay, they're not always, you don't always see how they're going to play out, all right? I'm going to work late today, which means you cost yourself family time and dinner at home and maybe even rest, okay? All of those things. And it might seem like a small cost, but if you keep making that choice, the price eventually may be your family, it may be your marriage, it may be your health. You see, sometimes we don't always see how they're going to play out, and we don't always think about the cost of the choices that we make. I've made some choices in my life at times where when I got the bill, right, and it wasn't always a physical bill. It wasn't always a bill in the mail. Sometimes it was just the consequences that came with the choice I made. I've gone, man, this won't worth it. Right? And there are consequences to every choice. It says this. It says, the sin of Judah is inscribed with an iron chisel engraved with a diamond point on their stony hearts on the corners of their altars. Even their children go to worship at their pagan altars and Asherah poles beneath every green tree and on every high hill. So let me just give you a picture of what's happening here. Things have gotten so bad that how they are has been engraved on their hearts. And the, Jeremiah describes their hearts as being stony, hardened hearts. And it says it is so bad that it's not just the people who understand and know. It's not people who have made their choice, all right, to do whatever it is they're doing. They have raised a generation who believe that what they're doing is normal. Y'all with me? And so the children naturally go... And worship the Asherah poles. And, and they worship the pagan altars. Because they have them everywhere. They're under every green tree and on every high hill. They assume that this is the way things are supposed to be. They assume this is the way things are supposed to go. And they have raised a generation so the adults had a choice. They served God and then they turned away from him. The children didn't have a choice. They were raised that this is normal. Now, I'm, I just want to say, because mostly parents in here and the children in the back, don't you ever believe that the choices you make are not having an effect on the children that you're raising? We, you, you, every single choice that you make is having an impact on those that are coming behind you. And if you make the wise choices, I don't, because I, I don't think everything's good or bad, right or wrong. I think a lot of choices we make are just wise and unwise. 
Okay? If we make wise choices, it points our children in a particular direction. But when we make bad choices, it affects our lives and those in our wake. Yep. And if we're not careful, don't ever parent and say, do as I say, not as I do. Because most learning is more caught than taught. They're going to pick up on what you say and what you do and where you go and how you act. They're going to see those things and they're going to internalize them and, and, and then it's going to come out, right? Y'all, y'all know, like I have, if somebody says you're just like your daddy or just like your mama, it's rarely a compliment, right? <laughs> sometimes it is, sometimes it rarely is it. Rarely you're acting just like your daddy. If my wife says, all right, Ronnie, she's not because I preached a good sermon. <laughs> okay, right? If I say, all right, Jenny, it's not because that her mama's name was Virginia. Uh, if I say, all right, Jenny, it's rarely a compliment. Okay, because they pick up those traits, whether we like it or not. They, they are caught more than they are taught. And he says, so I will hand over my holy mountain along with all your wealth and treasures and your pagan shrines as plunder to your enemies for sin runs rampant in your land. The wonderful possession I have reserved for you will slip from your hands. I will tell your enemies to take you as captives to a foreign land. For my anger blazes like a fire that will burn forever. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength, and turn their hearts away from the Lord. The problem here is idolatry. Listen, we, we can talk about all the specific sins you want to. Um, you do that on your own time. Here's what I want to tell you. If there's something that I can tell you is clearly forbidden in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it is anything that turns your heart away from God. Anything that turns your heart away from God. It doesn't really matter what it is. It can start out as a good thing and become a bad thing. But anything that turns your heart away from God, John would address it and tell us, anything that turns our hearts or our affections away from the Lord is a dangerous thing. He's talking about idolatry and sin has become rampant in their lives. And I would tell you that unabated sin will cost you the blessings of the Lord. Left unchecked, sin will eventually take from you the things the Lord has given to you. Here's the second thing. Don't depend on man. Man, we have a personality-driven world right now. Churches are personality-driven. Politics are personality-driven. Businesses are personality driven. And we follow the person. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute because I think there's some biblical understanding that we've got to have. But anytime you follow a person, you should do so with the understanding that mankind is flawed and sinful. You have to go into it with that understanding. The minute that you start believing that they're not flawed or sinful, you will place on them and place in them some things that are not healthy. It says this, it says, this is what the Lord says, cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness and in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat and or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Now, 
God called me to be a leader, not a savior. He called me to be a leader, not a Lord. Leadership is a biblical mandate. You can find it everywhere. Listen, and I don't care what kind of background you come from. If this offends you, I'm sorry. The Bible is not full of committees. God didn't come up with a committee to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. He didn't. You just don't find a bunch of committees in the Bible. That, that it's, it's not there. You find leaders who lead people. That's biblical. The problem becomes when we make leaders lords. The problem becomes when we take something that God anointed and make them God. And it happens way too often. We're like, oh, if this person could just become president. No, why don't they all go home for three years and let's see if we miss them. Amen. No, we, we, th- 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 that's not the answer. We've put way too much dependence on a personality believing that this person is going to resolve our problems. No, it doesn't really matter who the leader is if the people's hearts are not turned to the Lord. They're not going to be able to lead them. It doesn't matter who the pastor is if the people's hearts are not turned to the Lord. We, listen, we should follow people. I believe that's biblical. We just cannot depend on them for our salvation or our deliverance. Because, listen, I'm, I am a flawed, sinful person. And the day you believe I'm not, you are a fool. <laughs> right? I, I'm ju- I, I am flawed and sinful. And so are you. And the day you believe you're not. Now, some of you think your grandchildren are perfect, but they ain't. They're flawed and sinful. We all are flawed and sinful. And listen, listen, this this is why this is important at the judgment. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he is not going to ask you who your pastor was. He is not going to ask you who your president was. He is going to ask you who your Lord was. That's the question that you've got to answer. Who is my Lord? Who is it that I have been worshiping? And he, he tells us, like, he, he, he tells us that, listen, when we trust in the Lord, he says our roots grow deep. Everybody has a bad day. Everybody has stuff. Man, if I said, if I gave everybody five minutes to get up and tell me bad things that have happened in your life are happening in your life or that you feel like are going to happen in your life, we'd be here forever. Five minutes wouldn't be enough. We all have, we all have it. The reason why people respond differently is some people have roots that go down into the water because they're worshiping the Lord and other people are shallow and everything that comes along is the major crisis. Listen, we have to turn to him. Don't follow people. Here's the third thing. Don't trust your heart. This may be, and God knows we're in graduate time, and I guarantee you, some of you wrote it in a card you shouldn't have. It's the worst advice you could give somebody. Just follow your heart. No, 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 no. Your heart is, no, no. That's the, that may be the worst advice this time of year. Oh, I just encourage you to follow your heart. No, I'm, I'm, encour- I'm discouraging you to follow your heart. Don't do it. Your heart will get you in bad relationships. Come on. It'll get you it'll get you in some bad finances. Right? Get you in a bad job? A bad marriage? I heard I was in a round table with Henry Cloud this week and he said something like it was the it, it was just rolling over and over in my head. He's like, you got to know what you're interviewing people for. He said, the job description for a boyfriend and the job description for a husband are completely different. You got to know which one you hire. 
If you're hiring a boyfriend, then they can do these things. But if you want a husband, like knitting up, there's some things you need to mark off the list. And, and your heart, listen, some of you just go, whoo. My heart tells me. Don't, if somebody tells me my heart said, I immediately know there's a 50% plus chance that they are deceived. Here's why. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Every single person in this room can tell me a story about how your heart lied to you. It may have been a relationship. It might have been a job. It might have been, a, a, you know, a, a, a marriage, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Your heart lied to you. Why? Because it's deceitful. Your feelings never, gosh, this, this, this ain't where I need to go. That's another sermon. <laughs> Be careful about how you trust your feelings. If it's the Holy Spirit, that's one thing. If it's your heart, it's a different thing. He says, who really knows how bad it is? You don't know how misguided your heart can be. He says, but I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Like a partridge that hatches eggs, he, she has not laid. So are those who get their wealth by unjust means. At midlife, they will lose their riches. In the end, they will become poor, old fools. He says, your heart is the most, not your mother-in-law, right? N not your friend, your heart, the thing inside of you that you're like, oh, I just feel like I, I just fell in love. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. We, did, we weren't in the building. It was online only, right? Who, what kind of things do you fall in that you're happy about? Right? You fall in a mud puddle, what do you do? You get out. You fall in a ditch, what do you do? You get out. You fall in love. You're like, oh, I got to get married. No, you fell into something. You better get out. <laughs> Don't let your heart dictate your life. If you're not careful, your heart will lead you down paths. Your heart will get, cause you to buy cars and houses and get in marriages and do things, move jobs because you've followed your heart everywhere and it's been lying to you the whole time. It's the most deceitful thing. And so, like, if you've got graduate parties and you've already written that in a card, go buy another one and write something different. <laughs> it's bad advice. Trust me, I followed my heart a few times, more, time than, more times than I'm willing to own up to. And it, listen, there are days, because if you follow your heart, if you always do it when you feel like it, guess what? You ain't going to do much of anything. Because some days you just don't feel like it, right? Some days your heart ain't in it. Some days you ain't excited about it. It is a choice that you have to make. Don't follow your heart. Don't follow men and don't follow your heart. We're like, Pastor? If I'm not supposed to worship idols and I'm not supposed to follow man and I'm not supposed to put, put, follow my heart, what should I do? Here's the answer. Put your hope in the Lord. Idols are not the answer. Leaders are not the answer. Your heart is not the answer. The Lord is the answer. It says this, but we worship at your throne, eternal high and glorious. I, I, I have to give it to Jeremiah. His message is to millions of people, and next week we're going to talk a little bit about this, but how discouraging, there's a reason why he wrote, wrote Lamentations. How discouraging would it have to be to preach to millions and just a few? Take heed. I remember in this church on this stage, a missionary came and talked to us and he had been uh, at his station for like eight or 10 years at that point. And the year prior to coming here to tell us, talk to us, he had baptized his first convert. Eight, 10 years, first one. 
The thing I admire about Jeremiah is he's telling them, this all's going to happen, this all's going to happen, this all's going to happen. But he would always revert back and say, but God is worthy to be praised. He says, but we, and I, I believe he was speaking, I call it evangelistically, evangelistically. You know, he was, he was including some folks, and we don't know how many. It may have been two or three. It could have been a hundred, but it won a lot. But we worship at your throne, eternal, high, and glorious. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who turn away from you will be disgraced. They will be buried in the dust of the earth, for they have abandoned the Lord, the fountain of living water. O Lord, if you heal me, I will be truly healed. If you save me, I will be truly saved. My praises are for you alone. People scoff at me and say, what is this message from the Lord you talk about? Why don't your predictions come true? Lord, I have not abandoned my job as a shepherd for your people. I have not urged you to send disaster. You have heard everything I've said. Lord, don't terrorize me. You alone are my hope in the day of disaster. Bring shame and dismay on all who persecute me, but don't let me experience shame and dismay. Bring a day of terror on them. Yes, bring double destruction on them. Now, before I talk about turning to the Lord, I want to say that sometimes it's okay to say to the Lord, sick them. <laughs> now, I don't advise telling everybody that. But if you got to tell anybody, why not tell him? God, they have hurt me. They have ridiculed me. They've lied about me. They have betrayed me. Lord, I'm placing it in your hands. But Jeremiah says, happy are those who trust in you. Blessed are those who trust in you. And he says two specific things in this passage. He says, if you heal me, I will be truly healed. If you save me, I will be truly saved. That is the beauty of coming to Christ and not coming to your heart and not coming to an idol and not coming to man. That's the beauty of coming to the Lord. Because man may be able to temporarily relieve some pressure. Your heart may bring you a little bit of joy. An idol may distract you for a moment, but it cannot truly heal you and it cannot truly save you. But if you turn to the Lord, he is able to truly heal. He is able to truly save. Where we need to turn our focus and place our trust and lean into is the Lord. I'm not opposed to leaders. I'm not opposed to people who have their heart and everything. I'm not opposed to having things that are good and blessed and lovely. I'm not opposed to any of those things. But what the scripture says is none of those things can turn us away from the Lord because none of those things can save us. None of those things can heal us. There's an old song, a hymn. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Maybe. Just maybe the reason why the things have you so distracted and burdened and heavy and heartbroken is because you're looking at the wrong thing. What would grow dim if you just look toward him? <laughs> 